I'm Robert Greenwald from Brave New Films. Welcome to everybody around the country, around the world, who's watching this conversation. We're pleased and thrilled to have Representative Karen Bass with us, who's been here several times and is a long-term friend, collaborator, colleague, and is a shining example of real politics, real conviction, working from grassroots advocacy through this working in Sacramento and now in Washington, D.C., entering her fourth term. Finishing my fourth term. Finishing her fourth term. Wow. Okay. So, um, if you have questions, send them to uh, Brave New Films. Elizabeth is nodding and she's standing by. We'll pass the questions along and we'll also this staff from Brave New Films who's here in the room will be asking questions. I wanted to start with, we discussed this a little bit, but from advocacy, from community organizing to elected official, it was a gradual transition. Was it clear to you that you wanted to be elected official? And how do you gain, you know, how do you measure the impact? You know, when you're community organizing and you're meeting people and you're getting rents reduced or you're getting a house fixed that's clear and it's tangible, how do you find, what do you find about the elected piece that gives you similar effectiveness or success when there are successes? It's like three questions in one, which you know, you're not supposed to ask, but... <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay. That's fine. Uh, and if I forget, you'll just remind yes. me. Uh, so I have been an activist since I was really in middle school, and uh, so it's been in a, a lifetime, and I made a lifetime commitment at a very young age that I wanted to devote my life to fighting for social and economic justice. So throughout my life, that has evolved and twisted and turned into many different things. And uh, I never thought about being an elected official, frankly. Um, the bulk of my work has been uh, doing grassroots organizing in communities on various issues, international as well as uh, domestic. And in 1990, when the crack cocaine hit, the crack cocaine crisis hit in the 80s, really, um, it was very clear to me and many other activists that it was going to lead to mass incarceration. You could see it coming. And uh, so I stopped doing international work and just focused on domestic work, trying to figure out how to shift the agenda away from uh, criminalizing what I felt was a social, economic, and health issue and, um, and fighting the policies that came up. So I started an organization called Community Coalition, and my focus in grassroots organizing was policy. So it wasn't the type of organizing where we were fighting for a bus stop or, or individual change, uh, but it was fighting to change the quality of life in South Central Los Angeles and moving away from uh, criminalizing folks. So after several years of doing that, we built the capacity to uh, impact elections, um, building, the, building the precinct operations and all of that. And we were uh, very active on elections, fighting against three strikes, against you know anti-immigrant legislation, uh, fighting to get certain people elected, and then we have term limits that um, came into being in L.A. City, and uh, that's what eventually led to me uh, running for office. Uh, I first was thinking about running for local office, city council, because we had spent all of these years in South Central trying to deal with the quality of life there, and the person that was in office was going to term out, and the person that was most likely to succeed, we knew, was going to reverse everything we were doing. And uh, at that point, uh, the community coalition had been built up strong enough that it didn't need me any longer, because the whole point was to build, create an organization, build it, train the leadership, and then leave. And uh, so when it was clear I could move on, then I made a conscious decision to go inside. It also is tied into how you believe change happens fundamentally, and I believe that real change to benefit our folks happens through an inside and an outside strategy. So for me to go into public office, I just saw that as moving on the inside, but still very much involved uh, on the outside too. Did I hit them all? Pretty good, yes. <laughs> <laughs> very impressive. Um, one thing you said I wanted to go back to for a minute, you at an early age decided you yes. were going to commit to this. So yeah. how did Tell us, describe that decision and how that came about. What yeah, like? well, uh, I'm born and raised in L.A. Uh, my mother, interestingly, was also born and raised in L.A. at a time when African Americans really weren't here. 
My father came in the more traditional way, which is the great migration after World War II uh, from the South. And uh, so I would sit and watch TV with him when I was, you know, just 10, 11, 12 years old, watching the Civil Rights Movement. And, um, and I just could not conceive of sitting at a lunch counter and having people pour stuff on me. And, um, and so watching what was happening in the Civil Rights Movement, and at the time, the Civil Rights Movement, the whole world was blowing up. And I mean, you remember those years, we were convinced we were going to totally change the world. So you had the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, you had the anti-war movement, you had the Black Power Movement, all of the convergence of all of those movements. I watched them on the news and uh, couldn't wait to grow up so I could participate in them. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started uh, as an activist in middle school, uh, right in this area, you know, um, which is which the area uh, around Fairfax and, and Venice was a, a hotbed of activism. And I went to a high school that was a very activist-oriented high school. So they gave us time off classes to go protest the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my teachers were political and taught me about what was happening in Latin America and Asia and Africa, and um, and so that's how I grew up. Uh, my my father, though, we talked about it many years afterwards. He never wanted to see me be an activist, so I I credit him with the, with introducing me to that. But my parents never wanted me to be an activist because they were worried I wouldn't survive. It wasn't a question of disagreeing; they just didn't want me to get killed. And during those years, a lot of people were being killed. A lot of people were being killed. So um, that, was, that was why I got introduced at such a young age. And the first political campaign I worked on was uh, Bobby Kennedy's um, presidential campaign. I was, in that, I was in middle school then. And I um, forged my mother's name as a precinct captain. <laughs> and, and I went and I um, walked my precinct. Uh, but when uh, King was killed and Kennedy was killed and so many other people were killed, I really became disillusioned in our system and was looking for some other way to organize a society. So I went in search of different societies uh, right after high school. And in being inside, you made a conscious decision. Conscious decision. To be inside, which is unusual. Many of us just kind of fumble along and wind up places. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and tell us about when you made that decision, mm -hmm. and now that you've mm -hmm. made it, mm -hmm. how does it look to you? Sure. So what happened was, so I started to run for city council, and that wound up not working out. My father, that I just talked about, uh, became uh, very seriously ill. And I, at, at one point in my life, uh, prior to Community Coalition, I, it never occurred to me I could do political work and get paid. So mm -hmm. I had another life, which was I worked in the medical field. And uh, so all of my activism was after work uh, because we didn't have organizations like this. I mean, we didn't have ways that you could pay for being an activist. So um, I, uh, when he got uh, sick, I walked away from uh, running for city council and uh, took care of him um, for the rest of his life, which wasn't very much longer after that. And then I, I said, well, you know, who knows, maybe I'll run in the future. Uh, and then a couple of years later, um, Miguel Contreras, the uh, head of the labor movement here, I went to see him uh, to hit him up because Community Coalition was having its annual dinner. And um, I went to hit him up to buy some tables, and he hit me up to run for the state assembly. And uh, I'm like, why would I do that? And <laughs> why would I go to Sacramento? And then a few days later, uh, the congresswoman before me, Congresswoman Diane Watson, called me up and told me that I needed, that I'd been in the community long enough and I needed to go to Sacramento because there were no African American women in the state legislature because they had all turned out. And, um, and so I really wasn't sure I wanted to do that. And I spent a couple of weeks trying to decide. I actually went to Cuba. I um, took a group of young people from Community Coalition and I thought about, you know, whether or not I really wanted to make that sacrifice because you know, to run for office and be in office, you have to accept the fact that you're going to compromise some things that you didn't have to compromise when you were in office. Uh, it's an entirely different way to live your life. And, um, and then I wasn't sure what I could get done, so I went up to Sacramento and I talked to uh, people that I knew that were in office, like Sheila Kuehl and Jackie Goldberg, other activists that were up there. And they convinced me that if I had an agenda that I actually could get stuff done, 
So I, I did. I, I uh, ran, and uh, we had a real activist campaign, which was really nice. And I went up there, and I was still I was working on the same issues in Sacramento that I was working on in South Central. And in Washington, D.C., I'm working on the same issues hmm. in Washington, D.C., that I was working on in South Central. The big difference now is, that I'm very excited about, is that now I get to do my international work again, mm -hmm. which I had set aside. I consciously had stopped doing international work for about um, 15 years, or a little more than that, because I thought what was happening in South Central was so serious, and that uh, the whole criminalization of the community and, and how bad the drug situation was, the devastating impact it was having on the community, that I stopped doing international work. And in Congress, I get to do international work. Now, my focus, one of my focuses in Congress is Africa. And I actually get to go to Africa, whereas when I, when I was fighting against apartheid here, I didn't have any money to go to Africa, so, but now that I'm in Congress, I actually get to go. And I do find that uh, I can make a difference, and um, I don't have this, it's not the same joy of working in the community every day, but I am back in the community all the time. I come home every weekend, and uh, I do town hall meetings and community meetings all the time. So I get that, but I'm not immersed in the community like I was before, and I miss that. You know, I, I definitely, I, I tell the people at the Community Coalition all the time that I never uh, had the joy um, anywhere except for, you know, doing that kind of work. But, but the whole point of social change is it's not about you. You know, it's about the change you're trying to bring about, and so your focus is really on, you know, as many people that you can help be leaders and train just like everybody in this room and what you're doing, that's the goal because the goal is to for change to be sustained beyond you. So even though I loved being at Community Coalition, I wasn't needed there anymore. And I was there 14 years and uh, and I've moved on. They know, you know, I was there this morning. Um, but you know, I mean, I go when they call. But uh, the point is you build something and then you can move on to the next thing. My last question, and then we'll open it up, and those of you who are watching, remember you can post questions, and Elizabeth will be forwarding them to us. So you talked about the inside-outside element, mm -hmm. and I know it, over the years it's been a debate, maybe it's less of a debate today, but the notion of how are you most effective by working inside, by working outside, which, so that's one part of the question, not that it has to be either or. But the other part, and I often ask this with elected officials, how do we impact from the outside? Uh, is it petitions? Is it phone calls? Is it visits? Is it pickets? Is it sit-ins? And of course, some of it depends on who the elected official is. But in general, advise us how to be more effective once people are in office. Different conversation about getting people elected. It is all of the above. But one of the things that, that fascinated me about being in office was how our side, we fight to be in power, and then we don't know what to do with it when we get it. <laughs> and so here I was in the state assembly running things. I was the speaker. And I'd go out of my office, and there'd be all these people there, you know, mobilized to come up and meet with people, and they hadn't even called me. And it's like, you put me in the seat, why don't you use me? So I find that we are not strategic at all with our relationships. So it's not just that we've elected people to, to office. We know these people. We have relationships with them. And, and I think that we need to strategize. And by the way, we're doing that in South L.A. So the elected officials, the people that run the community organizations, we all sit in the same room and plot and plan. And uh, because the whole point of us being in office is to facilitate the work, you know what I mean? Is to, is to do our part uh, in the work. And so I don't believe in terms of the best way to bring about change, you must have both. You gotta have people inside, but you gotta have people outside too. And so at diff, you know, I have viewed my, where I am in my life now, it was a complete evolution. I didn't sit around and say, well, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna run for, none of that happened. The only thing that was consistent in my life is the commitment to fight for social and economic change. And it's played, I have played different roles at different times in order to do that. Thank you. Interesting. Questions? 
So I was at your town hall last uh, weekend, and you told you were telling people about your trip to the border. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Which town hall was that? The, at the school? Uh, Culver City. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, so I went to McAllen, uh, Texas, uh, a few weeks ago. I was actually supposed to, to uh, uh, go back again to some other places, but uh, and that'll, we, we'll be doing that. Tomorrow we're going to, to Victorville. Um, and I went, be, I mean, I, I just think what is going on at the border today is one of the worst things I have seen in my lifetime, and I've been around. <laughs> and it reminds me of when I was little, my mother describing to me what it was like to be in L.A. when the internment of the Japanese happened. And she saw her neighbors be pulled out of schools and, you know, just disappear. Uh, but what we, my focus on the border is the children. I, I work to try to transform the child welfare system because the foster care system is the driver system to incarceration. That's what happens to foster kids when they incarcerate them. So. I work on trying to, you know, stop mass incarceration from the beginning. And um, to know that we are kidnapping children and ransoming them back to their parents is just atrocious. The only thing that surprises me about this period is that there's not massive protests. I've been surprised by that because this is beyond egregious. I mean, when the mu Muslim ban happened, that was just a policy. And there was massive protests at the, uh, you know, at the airports, DACA, all these issues. And I don't know why these children have not, why it's not reached that level. Uh, but it was a heartbreak to, to meet children who had been told that their parents had left them on purpose, abandoned them. They were never going to see them again. They were going to stay in the detention center until they were 18. To talk to parents who were told that you're just going to court and you come back and you'll get your child and the child's not there. The fact that we've lost these children. So I don't believe any of the numbers. Mm -hmm. I do believe there are hundreds of children that will never see their parents again. And, um, and I think that unless we focus on that, the reunification. So I mean, I've done legislation that requires the, because you know the government's not responsible for the reunification. There is no government entity responsible. So I'm doing legislation now. I know nothing's going to happen with it, but we're just a few months away. This is not going to go away in January. I think the federal government should be responsible. I think they should find the kids. I think they should pay for transporting the kids. I think they need to pay, um, you know, um, for counseling, whatever. I mean, I think they owe these families something because they violated international treaties in, in stealing these children, just to make a point. Uh, I knew about this policy really early on in the Trump administration. Uh, Secretary Kelly, before he became chief of staff, he went on CNN and he floated the idea. And we jumped all over him. I, um, I, I was in a meeting with him and he didn't seem to understand what I was saying. And then I caught him in the hallway and followed him around and said, do you understand what you're talking about here? And, um, and they backed away from it for a minute and then they went for it full bore. You are an impressively busy person. Just to give us in the room and our audience an idea of what it is that you have on your plate, will you tell us what you're doing for the rest of the week or, or next week, what you have your hand in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, sure, but, but understand, I mean, I'm here, Robert's my friend, but I'm here because both of us are extremely invested in you guys. <laughs> you, you guys got to carry this torch. And so your development and your education and all is, is really critical to us. Um, so to me, this is a high priority. Um, but, you know, I mean, I work seven days a week. Um, when we have breaks, people think we have vacations. We don't have vacations. We just work differently. I was in Zimbabwe two weeks ago. Uh, next week I'm going to the Congo, to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'm going to Ethiopia for one day, and then I'm going to the Congo for one day. I'm going to the Congo because um, we want them to have an election, and we want the current president not to run. He's saying he's not. But, you know, the Congo has tons and tons and tons of problems. Um, but, uh, but that's it. I mean, I don't really have, I count time off in hours, not so much days. It's very, very difficult to get 24 full hours. 
Um, but usually when I'm here, I'm, you know, doing this. Uh, I'm also very much involved in another organization. I, I do, I like to start organizations. So. so, to address child welfare, I started a, a caucus inside of Congress called the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth. We got to have an outside strategy. So we started a group called the National Foster Youth Institute, which is the outside strategy to pressure the inside. And uh, we bring 100 foster youth, uh, young adults, they're 18 to 30, to Congress once a year from 100 different congressional districts to make the emotional connection with a member of Congress. We train them in organizing, we train them in policy, and we're setting up chapters around the country because the issue of foster care is actually a very bipartisan issue. It's really only an issue of political will. We know what to do. Uh, but it's a question of political will. And so it, it's a perfect example of an issue where if you create the pressure, you can actually transform this. And so that's uh, occupying a great deal of my time because it's a relatively new organization. Uh, I'm on the board. Um, and so we're trying to really look for the leadership and, and um, get the organization up and running. And how is that going so far? Or where are you in the process of creating the political will? Well, you know, at, at diff the, when we have the young folks come to Congress, it absolutely works. Uh, when they came last year, we passed five pieces of legislation right mm -hmm. afterwards. Uh, we were able to get the Republicans to um, uh, pass a policy that federal dollars are, we, we each get an, an allowance to allow us to use our federal dollars to pay for foster youth interns because <laughs> one of my Republican colleagues came to address the young people last year and he was encouraging them to volunteer and one of the young women got up and said, we're foster youth, we can't volunteer, we need money. <laughs> and she went on teaching him and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> um, well, she moved, it was Kevin so much. he changed the policy and said, okay, we won't ask you to volunteer. We will have absolutely had impact. And this year, it's a little different because we did pass real significant legislation. This year was more about fighting for implementation because that's one thing is that you can, you can work on policy and you can get it passed, but if you don't have the on-the-ground organizing to fight for implementation, you haven't necessarily done much. And how, do, how does one do that to fight for implementation? Probably an idea that many in the room and in the audience aren't familiar with. So, Well, hopefully, you know, um, this, is, this is where there's a disconnect between the activists and the people that are in office. Uh, so we have to build a strategic alliance, number one, so that the people in the community fight for the legislation they want to see. And then after it's passed, that then they fight for implementation. So the best way it's done is when it's done in strategic alliance. Mm -hmm. My challenge is I don't have the outside alliance so much, so I'm trying to help create it. I mean, there's tons of people that work on foster care, but are experts in the issue. Uh, I believe fundamentally in a basic principle continue to violate human rights, and also what is the U.S. Congress and the U.S. in general doing to stop multinational companies from selling arms and violating sanctions, um, especially when it comes to illicit flow of cash? Uh, yeah. So, uh, as a monitor of your presidential election, which was interesting. Um, I have major problems. I've always had major problems with U.S. foreign policy, which is why I've been interested in the international arena. Uh, but once coming into Congress, my issues now are really different. So my problem is how we do foreign aid, because I think it's pretty scandalous that we've been involved in foreign aid for, who knows, 60, 70 years or more. Excuse me, most of the African countries are 60 years old in terms of their independence. And if you look at most of what we do with our money is I think a lot of times, most of the time, we're funding ourselves. We're funding our own NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, as opposed to trying to really focus on African 
countries developing the capacity themselves. Mm -hmm. So 60 plus years later, a third of the continent of Africa doesn't even have electricity. So uh, I am actually from U.S. business involvement on the continent of Africa, something I never thought. I didn't go into it thinking that at all. But, uh, but I think we need to focus on more um, helping African countries build their own, you know, independence. Right now I'm working on infrastructure, looking at roads, bridges, airports, and ports. Uh, I think that should be the focus. I think you know that we have alliances with certain, there's certain dictators we're okay with, and then there's ones that we don't like. So the guy in, in DRC that I'm going to see, we don't like him. I just came from Zimbabwe, we didn't like Mugabe. But there's other leaders in Africa that have been in office for a really long time, and we're okay with them because we have a strategic military alliance with them. Uh, and there's some countries where we cut off the, um, the uh, export of weapons and some that, that we don't. Uh, we have a mixed agenda. Our agenda around Africa is about the United States and it's even more so now because now we're looking at national security, we're looking at uh, extremist organizations and so you know what's different is is that in the 60s, 70s and 80s it was about communism. It's not about communism now. You know it's about... To my second question about um, what the U.S is being able to stop multinational companies uh, supplying weapons and also uh, the cash. Yeah, and the cash as well. We're not, we're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. We're not doing anything except for to the, to the people that we like, we're still sending weapons. To the people that we don't like, we're not. Lately, I've been involved in trying to get a weapons ban in South Sudan. Um, you know, but first things that Trump did when he came in, because we had a ban um, in Nigeria, and then he lifted it. So our, our basic policy says, if you are a violator of human rights, we will not send you weapons. But in this administration, that, makes no, that policy makes no sense. On the cash, that's another issue. The cash, there's a, uh, an organization, S-E-N-T-R-Y, and you might want to look at that. Because it's, uh, um, I'm blanking on it, I think it's Bono, uh, the Enough Project. They now are doing um, a forensic analysis looking at the money. Because, you know, a lot of these guys own property in Malibu and Beverly Hills and all. And they're stealing their national treasure and, and doing that. And so I actually am going to be getting involved in that in the next couple of years because there needs to be enabling legislation that allows us to go after their money uh, overseas. Uh, and so I think that that's going to happen. But it's still going to be a mixed bag. Some people we're going to track and some people we're not. I, I just happened to finish reading two books on this, Ronan Farrow's book, mm -hmm. War on Peace, and then also Ben Rhodes' book on the Obama foreign policy. Uh -huh. And they're very interesting if you're interested in these areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get a sense of the scope of the problem. And uh, the Farrow book particularly talks about, and we know this intellectually, but he goes through it, all the money and all the resources just keeps going to the Pentagon. So what little there is goes back to us, and there's less and less and less of it. So every problem that comes up, the only solution is, oh, there's got to be a military solution, a Pentagon solution. You, you know, let me give you one example, and that's food. You know, our policy toward Africa until we uh, modified it recently is that we shipped food to Africa. Now, why on earth would you ship food to Africa? Number one, it takes forever to get there. But number two, the Africans can grow their own food. Why don't we help them grow their own food? So Obama's policy was to stop sending food and to send uh, technology, uh, scientific you know, analysis, or money. So if there's a famine in Ethiopia, why don't we buy food from Kenya and ship that t to Ethiopia? Well, why do we do that? Because we're dumping our stuff. That's why we're doing it. You know, and, um, and so that, it's that type of transformation of foreign aid that I want to see happen. That the big deal now is, is that we send used clothes. And uh, if, you, if you send a bunch of used clothes, then you suppress a, uh, their textile industry. Mm. Well, you can imagine a rice farmer who's got his whole crop, he takes it to market, and here come the Americans giving free rice. Mm. And we've just destroyed the local market. So it's things like that 
then I'm looking to try to transform how we do foreign aid. Other questions? As activists, what's the best way to get your attention? Oh, yeah, the, back to the question that uh, Robert was asking. Um, all of those uh, ways are important. It really is important when you make a phone call or send a letter. An email is a little more challenging because you can only email your representative. You can't, if you don't live in my district, you can't send me an email. And that's not something I've done. That's the, tech, uh, the technology infrastructure in the house. But uh, people should really understand that all of us track our calls and track our letters, and it does make a difference. And you can also always call the leadership. And, you know, it depends. Sometimes a protest is good, um, you know, um, getting people to have town halls and do things like that. I mean, all of those things people really do pay attention to. Uh, but back to what we were talking about before, where you have an opportunity to have a strategic alliance with an elected official that you know that is in line with you, you need to sit down and plan together. That's what you need to do. And uh, I appreciate people bringing, you know, people will tell me about legislation that's happening in Congress and they'll want to know, well, how come I haven't signed up on this or signed up on that? There's 535 of us and thousands of people, let pieces of legislation. Nine times out of 10, if it's something that you know I would be consistent with, I just haven't heard about it. Uh, and so people bringing it to my attention and I'll go, oh, okay, I'll sign on to it. I just didn't know. It's important to tell people what you want to see happen. Other questions? Any more? Don't be shy. Um, tell us a little bit about um, ways that you see what the Congress can do or the House can do in January, assuming that elections may create change? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, um, and Robert and I were talking about this, and we're all talking about it, and that's the potential for the House to change in the next 85 days. And I'm very hopeful that, that that is going to happen, and all of the indicators are that it is going to happen based on all of the elections that are happening. There's an election happening today. We should pay attention to you the first time ever. Um, that's wild. Um, so if the House changes power, what, what people need to understand, because I think people don't really understand what it means when you have one party that controls the White House, the Senate, and the House. People will ask, well, how come you can't, you know, vote on this, or how come you can't do that? Because it, in a way, it's a complete dictatorship. So um, when we take over in January, then we can do gun control, and we can do immigration, uh, immigration reform. Now, the question is going to be whether or not the Senate we lose the Senate, I mean we win the Senate, that's a much higher bar because there's not that many Republican seats up. Most of the seats that are up for election are Democratic seats. And every other election the Senate flips back and forth, meaning that the majority of the seats that are up are Democratic one time, next time the majority of the seats in 2020, the majority of the seats will be Republican that will be up. So um, if we are able to uh, win the House, you will see us immediately repair health care because they, even though they weren't able to repeal the Affordable Care Act, they've tried to murder it slowly. Um, and, and Trump has been doing that administratively as well as we've been doing that legislatively. So you'll see a lot of things like that happen. I will be excited about um, criminal justice reform. Reform. I'm about mobile care reform. What I'm going to do uh, on Africa. Uh, if we take over the House, I chair that committee, mm -hmm. so I'll be able to help set the Africa policy from on behalf of Congress. Um, and maybe I can get to some of your questions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, though, is that I can set the policy in one area. Won't be able to do much on the military. Really? You by yourself won't be able to change the whole military industrial <laughs> complex? No. Nope. What are we here for? Not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how can people get involved, help you, support you? Which organizations, how and where? Well, uh, one of the things that I've been involved in, tell me if I can't say this, 
And then um, you can say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's giving me permission. Yeah. in your car and drive an hour uh, north, an hour south, and there are seats that we really should take back. And so to do that, uh, I started a group called Sea Change. And what we have been doing is we've been working with all the various resistance groups in collaboration with them. And we've been taking people from here into Republican districts. Uh, this summer, we started a youth project with high school and college age youth. And they named themselves A New Tide. And um, what they're trying to do is they are trying to specifically reach the 18 to 30-year-old voters in these Republican districts. Uh, I've done youth work uh, since I was a youth. <laughs> and uh, I've always believed that the way you work with young people is you bring them together, you provide resources, and leave them alone and let them <laughs> come up with. In other words, I can't tell an 18-year-old what's the best way to reach out. Number one, the technology changes so fast, I can't keep up with it. Uh, and so this, they came together, they went through two months of training, and they created an app, they created Instagram, um, uh, YouTube videos, they came up with all of these ways, and now we're going to purchase the uh, voters, you know, the, the data for the voters, so that they can then send their information to all of those uh, voters. So anybody that is interested in helping them do that, or work with Sea change uh, just let us know. Dylan right here is one of the leaders of Sea Change, and uh, <laughs> <It's> Dylan, <laughs> you can actually tell him to plug you in on a Saturday, either to physically go to the district or to do phone banking or to work with the uh, young people. So we should go to the website, Dylan, the Sea Change website. Is Absolutely. It? Okay. And what is it called? Okay. C S E A. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I want to thank Karen and Dylan for coming here and for speaking My with pleasure. us today. And uh, those of you uh, who are watching, if you aren't signed up, we're going to be premiering a new short film tomorrow about Father Greg and the Homeboys. There will be a panel discussion and premiere the film tomorrow night starting at 7 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Please join us then. And again, Karen. Thank you so much. Anytime. Okay. You're welcome. <clears throat>